Hello, penguins. How are you a bit of thistle down today? Welcome to my talk, Storm Boy the Game, the Game Director's Postmortem. Now, before we start, please check that your phone is on silent and be warned that this talk contains spoilers for both the game and the story overall if you didn't study it in school. So if you don't want it to be spoiled, now is the time to leave. Okay. In this talk, I am going to cover my approach to leading the direction of the adaptation of Colin Teeley's novella, how I identified and used the theme to guide all of our design choices, and close by touching on the challenges brought by launching on so many platforms at once. So I really hate these intro slides at the start, talking about who the speaker is, but I think in this case it helps to understand my background as it goes on to inform a lot of the decisions that I made and the way I approach things. So I've been working in games since 2007, and when I joined Interzone Games, I was first a, um, <laughs> an office research intern, um, and then I became a content and open world designer for a soccer MMORPG, and then moved into production. From there, I've managed the creation and live support of games across multiple platforms, both for clients and as well as in internally developed products, working with both new and licensed IPs. At uni, I studied theatre and multimedia design with my honours thesis in tragedy, its function and how it could be applied to game narrative. Overall, the project development processes for both design and theatre were both centred on iteration and working towards a goal. Through the design process, I became used to the idea of defining a target market, brainstorming, thumbnailing, making decisions fast and testing them, knowing that I could always iterate. And acting is the same. You try something, see how it works, change and adapt. I became used to the idea of an immov immovable opening night, which comes in handy as a game producer as well. I also developed a performance, the show must go on mentality, and became used to having songs or scenes or lines cut, sometimes because they weren't going to be ready on time, and sometimes they just didn't work, which we sometimes found out after going live in front of an audience. I was used to improvising, rehearsing, and importantly, deferring to the director. So, what is a director? A director, loosely, is one who directs, and that's a pretty generic definition. As I said, my background is in theatre rather than film or TV, so that's where my own definition comes from. In my experience, the best directors I've worked with have made their priority being the eyes of the audience. They have a vision for the show. It's not an exact vision, but it's a focus for the way the audience will feel and what they might think. As an actor on stage, you always give the best performance you can, um, either for your own performance or what you can inspire out of a fellow actor. But you never see what the audience sees. You can't see how you look to them, so you have to trust the director. And the director will tell you if and when something isn't working, and they help you get closer to the effect that they're looking out for. And directors are used to working with groups of people, actors, costume designers, dramaturgs, scenographers, sound designers, prop masters, lighting technicians, among others, who all have their skills in their own specialty. Now, the goal isn't to control everyone, but to guide them to work towards, uh, together to work towards a singular vision and experience for the audience. It's one vision, but many contributors. And that's the approach that I brought to directing Stormboy. Every part of the team were able to contribute but they also trusted me to be the eyes of the audience and to hold the vision. Stormboy the game had a pretty tight deadline. We were asked to be ready in time, uh, to release in line with a new movie that had been filmed, which was uh, currently looking for distribution. Originally, this would have been six months after our, uh, after our initial meeting, but then the movie's release date was delayed and our new timeline became based on the launch of the new edition of the books, which was December the 6th, 2018. From our first meeting with the IP holders, through pitch, development and then release, it was nine months part-time. I say part-time because each of us was on multiple projects, which meant that we were often distracted or split in our time. And it was often unclear exactly how much time we'd have for Stormboy versus the other projects, which often would take priority unexpectedly. And nine months is actually more like six months plus console submission and age ratings. So, six months part-time ended up being more like three or four months of actual full-time work. We had such a short development time that it, and many decisions had to be made quickly. So it therefore became very important that there was a vision to aim towards, 
a sort of quick reference to test against when we needed to make those decisions. I approach Stormboy the way I approach all licensed IP. And if you were at, the, at GCAP a couple of years ago and saw this talk that I did with Anthony Sweet on writing for IP, then this will be a refresher for you. But if you didn't, I can't encourage you to go and watch it because the talk isn't online. But don't worry, I'm going to cover the main points of it briefly in the context of adapting Stormboy. So firstly, and most importantly, be a fan of your IP. Now, I'll admit I never read Stormboy in school, but when the opportunity to work on it came up, I dedicated myself to becoming a fan. I think when I heard about the meeting, I bought and sped read through the book. I highlighted anything that might be possibly useful along the way. I digested it, picked it apart, and did everything I could to become intimately familiar with the story. Next, oops, is to locate your story in time and space. So when you're approaching an IP, it's always a good thing to check in on, do you want to tell a story that's a prequel, so something that happens before the events of the story, a sequel, something that comes after, a parallel story, which is another story that happens alongside the events, which may or may not intersect with the story, or a retelling. For Stormboy, we decided to do a retelling of Colin Teeley's story and tried as much as possible to play within the canon in the book. The setting is the Coorong National Park in South Australia. Specific areas are mentioned, and this went into location research, and then that was used in the design of the in-game setting. And speaking of research, the next step is to research the canon and law. And that is, look at whether other incarnations of the IP exist and whether you're obligated to follow them. The 1979 movie was a retelling like ours, and the new movie, so we were told when we started the project, would be a sequel that relies on flashbacks to retell the story. We checked with Victor, our contact at New Holland Publishing, and we were told not to try to be a companion to the new movie, and we were to just pitch whatever we wanted. Referencing the first movie wasn't required unless we really wanted to. As I hadn't studied the book, I also hadn't watched the movie from 1979, I started looking at clips, but when I watched them, I really didn't like their portrayal of Hideaway Tom, which raises an important point. I hadn't previously set my expectations based on what other people had interpreted the characters as or how they depicted the events. While I recognised that the movies were canon, I had the opportunity to tell this version of the story that I wanted to tell. So I decided not to reference either of them and stick entirely to the canon of the original story to form and keep our own version of Stormboy. Of course, this was all passed through the IP holders and going through this process helped build trust that we would look after their P, which meant that we were on the same page when we got to define our key pillars. Defining the dramatic pillars are another way of describing, say, themes or concepts. Things that, if removed, would mean that an IP just wouldn't feel the same. So once you've identified your IP's dramatic pillars, you can map them to game pillars and use them to guide your vision. This focus helps to ensure that the story and the game design stay on track and that you always have something to test against. Does it stay th true to the themes? Does it align with the key pillars? If yes, then keep it. But if no, try and think of another solution. Stormboy is a story about many things. Most stories, especially the good memorable ones are. So is it a story about a widower? Is it a man angry with society who chooses to hermit himself? Is it about the, um, uh, the environment? And is it about uh, conservation and against hunting? So I chose to derive my focus from the closing sentiments of the book. To me, it was a book about grief, a book about lost loves and absent friends and how their memory allows them to live on. How Mr. Percival and all of those that have died aren't really lost because they live on in our hearts and in our minds, and because of that, they do not really die. In the first meeting with the IP holders, I dropped a few words that could have been thematically relevant just to see what they liked. Yes, yes, the friendship. So that was one of the things that I chose to also focus on. And to me, those three things, friendship, grief, and memory, were key. To me, anything outside of this would be nice, but it was noise. This retelling was going to focus on a child's first best friend, their first love. It was about Stormboy, his grief, growing up and moving on with a healthy memory of his childhood with Mr. Percival. 
It wasn't about his dad moving away from society. It wasn't about societal or environmental issues. It was about this little boy who was alone and he rescued this baby pelican and he loved him and the pelican loved him back and wouldn't leave him even after death. The importance of Hideaway was maybe to be a foil, the shadow version of Stormboy, who maybe had never really coped with or moved on from the loss of his wife. But the one emotional concept that pulled all of this together was nostalgia. But nostalgia for who? When we approached the design of the game, we thought about who might be playing and how they might play it. If you want to be the eyes of the audience, you'd better know who your audience is. Stormboy is studied in lower primary school across much of the nation. As a strong reader myself, I liked the idea that a reader that wasn't as strong, who might be struggling to understand the themes of the, of the book, could play this game and really be able to relate. But if these kids can't read very well, they still have two movies which they can watch instead. So what can a game do that the movies cannot? Through interaction, we can allow Stormboy to be something of a proxy for the player. I wanted kids to be able to experience the same thing as Stormboy. And then, on the other hand, I wanted the adults who might be playing with them to be able to remember back to when they were a kid, when they had a bond with someone or something that was so strong that it felt unbreakable, so that losing them would hurt like nothing else, and yet give them comfort that they weren't truly alone, because that person or pet would be forever in their memory. So, to me, this meant two things. To create nostalgia, I need to make sure that Stormboy was relatable, and I needed to make sure that players would bond with Mr Percival. And then these two things became the guiding force for the practical expression of the pillars of friendship, grief and memory through evoking a feeling of nostalgia. So starting with the first, how can we make Stormboy relatable? In Understanding Comics by Scott McLeod, he talks about how abstract illustrations can make us relate more and feel closer to characters than higher detail renderings because of our ability to project into them. They don't look like specific people. So, for example, our Storm Boy could have been any light-skinned boy with brown hair. When our concept artist, Hussein, drew the very first concept based on the ideas that we'd come up with, there was a simplicity to the characters and a sketchy painterliness that I found really appealing. Now, we probably should have, in an ideal world, gone through and tried lots of different art styles and played around a whole lot more, but we just didn't have time and we didn't have many resources and we just had to sort of push through it. Choose something, try it out and review it if needed to. I also knew that the design would evolve as time went on and that this was an excellent starting point at least. I love the idea of a painterly sort of an illustrative style, something like Paperbark had done with watercolour book illustrations. But I wanted to make sure that we had something representative of the setting. So while watercolour suited Bush, I felt like there was a thicker, bolder feeling to the sea. Something vivid, more like oil or acrylic. My assistant game director, Jess, and I went onto Pinterest to find both photographic references as well as art references. Firstly, for references of the area, as well as any really moody photos that showed interesting colour combinations. And with the photographic references, I wasn't looking for realism. We collected reference photos and discussed them in order to define things like sky colour, ambient light and reflections in the sea. And if someone pointed out to me, well, this photo has been retouched, I didn't care. I was looking for a mood. I asked them, haven't you ever stood somewhere marvelling at the, the way the light shines, the colour, how you feel, and you just want to capture that moment. So you pull out your phone, you hold it up, you take a photo, and it just doesn't capture it. The photo might look right, but it doesn't feel right. The photo is real, but the moment is hyper-real. And it was this hyper-reality that, to me, is so representative of memory and evokes a nostalgic feeling. It's not informed by fact. There's emotion attached to it, and that heightens everything. Now, this isn't a new invention or anything like that. It's just a trick I outright stole from photo editors and cinematographers, but it's very useful. This is an early version of Stormboy's colour story. 
Originally, we'd wanted the colours of each scene to be representative of the season and the time of day when the scene was set. But it became more important that we map and reinforce the emotional journey for the player. Uh, in the way that a chorus in a Greek tragedy would suggest to the audience what they should feel and for which character. So we forewent reality again and instead focused on how the colour of the scene uh, made us feel and where that suited the story, revising the colour story over and over again until it felt right. And this focus on feeling over fact was something that underpinned a lot of our artistic decisions. But it didn't mean that we didn't try to reflect the real place where Stormboy is set. We looked at artworks done by artists in the Kurong region to see how they captured the light, the sea and the sand. There were some great oil and acrylic paintings that showed up and the vibrancy of the medium did lend itself well to that feeling of a memory. We particularly liked an artist who was from Gulwa named Chris Wake, whose paintings of the region helped set the scene and define the colour and texture that we wanted to aim for. Her paintings had a sketchy, impressionistic feeling to them, similar to Hussein's first concepts. Also on our Pinterest were 3D models that we felt we might be able to reference when we approached building the characters in 3D. And our favourites were some models by an artist named Dmitry Gravenkov. And I'm sorry, Dmitry, if you're watching this somewhere and, um, and I've absolutely butchered your name. But these models had a similar look to the original character concept that Hussein had drawn. And this informed the way that we would approach taking the 2D character designs into 3D. We were on a pretty tight schedule, as I said. So using those models, as well as some others specifically of birds as reference, Mr. Percival went straight into 3D. Jess, my assistant director, is also an amazing 3D artist and built all the characters in the game. And by the way, she's got a talk tomorrow at 10 a.m. So highly recommend that for entry-level artists, but also generally applicable to anyone. Um, so she played around with how to build a cute pelican and how to get a painterly texturing style. This meant that we were solving the problem of how to express that 2D style in a 3D character. Meanwhile, in parallel, Hussein started drawing concepts for Stormboy and the other human characters. We were aiming for a childlike feel, as those these were illustrations in a picture book that had come to life as we now knew how we could take them into 3D. When reviewing them, I noticed that they had a somewhat Tintin feeling to them. And the familiarity that I felt let me know that we were heading in the right direction. Now, to get players to bond to Mr. Percival, we knew we needed not just a, a cute character design, but that we wanted the, pel the pelicans to behave in a cute way. While some of that was the design for the way he moved or responded to things, such as the way he lagged behind Stormboy on the beach, or the way he would watch you hold the fish but never actually pick it up, I can't possibly understate the role of animation in this game. Now, I love birds, and as a kid, I had, a pet, I had pet geese, I had a pet hen, and I had budgies. We had so many birds in our backyard that we would feed as well. I love birds. But pelicans are not generally regarded as the cutest bird. Mark, our animator, would send me videos of pelicans he'd found as reference and they were not so universally cute. So instead, we talked a lot about a boy and his dog. And that ended up informing so much of the relationship between Storm Boy and Mr. Percival. It was really important that this was Lassie and not a bird that was trying to intimidate you out of your fish and chips. Mark absolutely loves dogs, so that made it really easy for him. Again, we weren't seeking realism. Pelicans waddle, they're very heavy, and frankly, they're pretty terrible on land. But Mr. Percival trots along with his wings open. To all pelican lovers, sorry, we skipped a few affectations in order to aim for a more universal cuteness. So now that I've covered my role as game director, our three pillars of friendship, grief, and memory, our aim of nostalgia and how we set about achieving it, I'd like to talk a bit about some of the decisions made during the course of the development. I could talk about every single part of the game and the trials and tribulations that we faced and overcame for much, much longer, but I'm just going to focus on places where we needed to change direction or solve a problem to enhance the experience for the player and how the vision helped for that. So fish feeding is one of the first games that we prototyped. It's basically started out as three cubes that were grey. They flash green. You have a sphere that you flick towards them when they're green. If 
you time it right, they get bigger. The other cubes all have a timer which counts the number of times that another cube has had a ball thrown to them while they were green without them having a ball thrown to them. In other words, they have a patience meter. And when that patience meter goes off, they turn red. Now, it was super basic. And yet the first time I played it, I was utterly delighted that I could piss off two, two cubes and make them turn red by making another cube bigger and fatter. So I knew that in its basic, basic form, it felt right. But we realised in testing it, after putting in the pelican models and a bucket of fish, that people just didn't get that they had to actually throw the fish to feed the pelicans. They'd recognised that the fish were in the bucket, they'd see the pelicans open their mouths, they'd tap the fish and the pelicans would watch. The players were delighted. They'd tap and hold the fish and drag them around and drag the fish onto the pelicans and let go. And then they wouldn't understand why the pelicans didn't reach out and take the fish. We thought about making it easier for the player so that we could either throw the fish or if you drop, dragged it over the top of them that they'd just eat it. But I really liked the idea that the pelicans were just a bit derpy. As I said, growing up, we had so many birds that we used to feed, and sometimes they're just so dense when you're feeding them. You throw something to them, and if they miss it, they just look at it and then look up at you. And like they just expect you to pick it up and feed it to, you, to them again. Or maybe there's some weird instinct where if it falls on the floor and doesn't move, it's bad dead and they shouldn't eat it. But anyway, I liked that behaviour. It was something that I knew and I felt was very cute and very bird-like. And I wanted the pelicans to behave that way. But the players were still at a loss and feeling bad that they weren't able to feel the feed the pelicans. But they just didn't know why or how to do it differently. So I revised the excellent industrial design book, The Design of Everyday Things, by Don Norman, especially the part about affordances. Affordances are defined in this book as being the clues that are given to a user about how something can be used. And I was thinking, well, it's not clear that the fish need to be thrown. So I asked the artist to dress the area with some fish that, in the hypothetical narrative of the scene, had been thrown beyond the pelicans that they hadn't picked up. And it worked. It was a silly thing, but it worked. Players now had enough information. They saw the bucket with fish. They saw where the fish were. By seeing those fish out beyond the pelicans, knowing that they would ignore them, it made a lot of things make sense subconsciously. It builds up a story of the way the game's world works, and the pelicans then appeared stubborn and lazy, which made them have personality, and that personality made them seem cute, bonding the player to the, to the three Mr P's. And then, when it came to playing fetch with Mr Percival later in the game, the player had already learnt the basic idea of how it wor would work, allowing for some real a boy and his bird moments. Sand surfing went through a few iterations of how Stormboy himself would move, which were fueled by balancing feeling versus reality. But a big question became, what does Mr Percival do? There was just no good place to put him. Originally, he kind of potted along behind Stormboy and just kept trying to catch up to him. But the way the level was built, Stormboy would basically get to the bottom of the map and then teleport up to the top and again and again and again in order to have an endless scene. But what would happen is Stormboy would move a lot faster than Mr Percival, so Stormboy would end up lapping Mr Percival. So we thought about, well, maybe he can be flying above, but there was no way that we could think of doing that that would feel naturalistic or make sense. So we brainstormed, but we ultimately couldn't come up with a good way to solve this, so we just had to move forward. So we just removed Mr Percival. And then, in the help text, I excused it away by saying that Mr Percival will just be waiting for you on the, on the beach when you're done. It felt like a really cheap solution, but it made sense in the story's world. In fact, it was kind of a line in the book's text. And then, when we watched a playthrough by a streamer, that line of help text that was just built to cover that we didn't know what to do with Mr Percival ended up being one of the lines that was quoted to show how loyal Mr Percival was. It ended up building character and building empathy in the game, bonding the player with Mr Percival. The scene with the hunter was a challenge and probably the best example of my The Show Must Go On mentality 
as well as an understanding of tragedy. Originally, this was going to be a game like everything else. It was originally planned as a play as Mr. Percival game, just like the Saving the Sailors game. It was going to be a mini game where basically you'd try and distract the hunters while the ducks would try and escape. But it felt really gamey. It had to be one of those endless games where you're not so much trying to win, but delay losing for as long as you can. So trying the design I'd originally come up with, it just didn't feel fun. It was fake, forced, and just didn't do anything. It was just very abstract. David, our programmer, asked if he could try an alternative that would achieve the same goals. So he did. And I sat with him at the lunch table and, and said to him, so I, uh, I played the new Hunters game. And he just looked up at me and said, yeah, it's not working, is it? And it wasn't. And, and he apologised and said, you know, sorry I couldn't get it to work, but I didn't mind, but I just knew that we had to do something. But we just had to cut it. It wasn't working. So because we couldn't find a sort of mini game that felt like it would express the, the connection between the two of them and the way that we could tell this part of the story, you know, maybe it just had to be a cutscene. So keep in mind, I hadn't wanted cutscenes originally, as I didn't want to take control away from the player. We'd already been putting more and more cutscenes in as at the start and the end of levels, sometimes out of necessity and sometimes because it just felt right. But it was never anything this long where so much was happening. This decision was also made fairly late, so we had to discuss how this could impact on the production schedule. We laid out what quotes were needed to tell the story, what events would happen during the scene in the Kurong where Stormboy runs through, and at what point there's a shotgun, at what point ducks fly past, or Mr. Percival, and at what point the cutscene is triggered, and what would happen there. Fortunately, we did have enough bandwidth to add in this new scene that we wanted. I still didn't really want to take away agency from the player, but I also didn't want to have a weird situation where Stormboy was in his new run animation cycle and the player just decided to run back the other way. So we took away agency. Stormboy is shaken out of his usual casual jog and begins to run. The player can't stop the next events from happening. And that worked perfectly for this moment in the story. One of the things I love about tragedy is that feeling of a train wreck that you just can't stop. And that's the feeling that Stormboy would have felt, helpless to stop Mr Percival and helpless to stop the hunter. And as a, as a player, taking away that agency adds to that feeling. There are other parts of this scene that I'd love to go into more detail on, but it was this removal of agency that fell most in line with my intentions for this section, more so than the original minigame idea. Dream Percival, also known as Ghost Percival or Storm Boy's Grief Fever Dream, was originally inspired to be like the Birdman level of Pilot Wind 64, where you can just fly around for as long as you want taking photos of things. Originally, I'd wanted the player to be able to fly Mr. Percival around for as long as possible, totally free. But when we went deeper into how we were going to build this, it became apparent that we'd need a way to deal with showing the horizon. And unlike in um, Pilot Wing 64, there is the rest of the Koorong and the rest of South Australia beyond. So we also needed a way to stop players from flying as far as they could. This was a problem we weren't sure how to solve, so we kind of just dealt with it later because we didn't need it for any demos or promotional material. And it wasn't until I was on a flight to Seattle for PAX West and looking down through the clouds that we were about to fly through that I rethought this. Instead of showing the entire island, we ended up changing to a swirling scene above the clouds. We went through a few iterations of this, including a fog that got so thick but kind of felt like you kept moving until you turned around and found you were exactly where you just were. And then you turn around and you're just at the lookout post. But we eventually designed a funnel where you couldn't fly through, you couldn't fly above, and would gently guide you down towards the lookout post. Originally, we'd planned for Mr Percival to fly down to the lookout post where Stormboy, Hideaway Tom and Fingerbone had buried him. It would then go straight into the final scene 
the moment of saying goodbye. But Jess and Aaron, our studio creative director, came to me with an idea. What if, after Mr Percival lands, we transition to Stormboy, who can then walk towards Mr Percival on the lookout post, and then Mr Percival would fade away? The original idea was that Mr Percival couldn't actually leave Stormboy, so he flies back and comes to stay in Stormboy's memory. But this new addition meant that Stormboy lets Mr, per Mr. Percival go, rather than holding onto him in a state of denial. The more metaphoric nature of this scene meant that the final scene then could have a different setting, giving us the opportunity to integrate that positive feeling again, while reinforcing that Mr. Percival lives on within Stormboy's memory. Building the scene we wanted wasn't as simple as we'd hoped. The hope was that, as Stormboy walked towards Mr. Percival, that he would fade out. And then if Stormboy turned around and walked back the other way, Mr. Percival would fade back in, kind of like he was in denial and didn't want to let go. It would have been done in a very simple way, where Mr. Percival's opacity was linked to how far away Stormboy was, and that should have been easy. But the problem came down to the way Mr. Percival had been built, because Mr. Percival is a 3D model with wings and model eyes and things like that. When this goes transparent, you begin to say, see the overlapping of the mesh, causing it to look less mystical spirit and more creepy horror ghost. We discussed a few options to resolve this, as we already had two versions of Mr. Percival in that scene, which is the one that the player had been controlling and the one that actually flies in and lands on the lookout post. The most elegant solution may have been to have a render texture of Mr. Percival flying in and sitting on the lookout post. But this would have required a lot more testing and fine tuning to make sure it performed as expected. And if the players just stood there endlessly, how long did that animation loop have to be for Mr. Percival? Ultimately, we decided to cut this part in favour of a triggered event where the 3D Mr. Percival disappears in a sin hiding burst of sparkly particle effects due to prioritisation of other bugs and, of course, our old friend, time. As I said before, Stormboy came at us very suddenly and we had to make our decisions fast. Originally, we would have had six months to get it out on mobile and PC and maybe a later console release. This was to fall in line with the original projected date for the movie release. Then Sony picked up the movie and we had to send through documentation showing that we weren't actually using any of their movie. And, um, and we got first a small and then a big delay. We took the small delay as our new release date, which would have been nine months from our first meeting to our launch date. Um, but we also wanted to commit to additional consoles. This was also in line with the planned book reprint. So aside from that, the new consoles, I chose not to budge from the scope that we decided on. I wanted the extra buffer. We could polish the game until the cows came home, but as far as I was concerned, we couldn't miss that date. So knowing that we had more times, but that we might have more consoles, I refused to get greedy as a designer. That's the producer in me coming out. I don't think we even told the team that we got the extra months for a while. Counting backwards, we set milestones for each of the platforms, as well as the age rating submissions, something not really needed for iOS, Android or Steam, but at that time, critical for all consoles. And some of these were like age ratings for multiple regions as well. And, and multiple region submissions for the consoles. And some of the age rating submissions required content completions and a physical submission of the game build on a zip drive posted to them. So, I love that you're all here listening to me now. But unfortunately, my colleague and producer on this project, Sam McCulley, is giving a really great talk about preparing your game for multi-platform release. So I really recommend going and watching his talk in the vault, or whatever it's called for GCAP, afterwards, um, because he gives a really good overview of all of the things that we're aware of that gave us the leg up in preparing for this. So we set ourselves a deadline. We had to get all platforms out by November 20th, 2018. And this meant we had to do a lot of planning to make sure that there was enough time to do everything needed for each specific platform in multiple countries, as well as having contingency in place for them. Sam made a lovely spreadsheet, but we ended up just scribbling a panic timeline on a whiteboard, which looked 
like this. We knew from previous experience how long it would take for each platform to be approved after submission if we happened to be approved on the first attempt. We added two or three hypothetical resubmission rounds into our date. Thankfully, Stormboy has no multiplayer and no online save, so we knew that there were less things that could potentially be failed on. You can see our submission dates on the bottom left in pink or red, however that's showing up. Releasing as globally as we could, we had multiple age ratings that we had to apply for. Each had different requirements and timelines. So as soon as possible, we took stock of how long each of these would take to get back to us, as well as whether they needed to be delivered before we could submit to each platform, as some platforms you have to apply for at the same time as you submit and others you don't. You can see where we slotted in age ratings amongst the PAX submissions and dates in the top left in green. And PAX were the next set of milestones to worry about, specifically PAX West and PAX Australia. These were the two shows that we were planning to hit in the lead up to release. We designed our demo to throw you in the middle of gameplay, the part of the story where you're really bonding with Mr. Percival. But what should we show? PAX Australia would be a month before launch, so we would pretty ha much have the entire game ready by then. PAX West was a few months prior, so we had to make sure that whatever we had for that would be polished, show off some, but not all. We thought it would be nice to have a progression, new content for each, without spoiling too much of the very short story. I don't think this difference between the builds really gave us much benefit, even if it focused the effort of the team to really polish these areas of the game first and then worry about everything else later. So on the right side of the screen in purple, this was the status when we uh, drew up this timeline, the status of all parts of the game, with green asterisks representing what was going in for PAX West and then the circle representing adding in swimming for PAX Australia. Now, I wish I could say that we planned for all consoles right from the start, because that would have been awfully clever of us. A lot of forethought and very ambitious, but we didn't. As I said, we were more prepared than most, but ultimately, why was it available on so many platforms? Because we could, that's why we're massive show-offs. But I do lie when I say we released simultaneously on all platforms. We missed Android. That's right, the platform that was regarded as the easiest was left until last. We forgot a really simple thing, that there are about a million different Android devices that all perform really differently. In the end, we released one day late, and then players were unable to run the game. We put a very clever check in, and this was not my idea at all, but it's a clever check to see what the frame rate is. If it's too low, we auto lower the performance level when you load into a new scene. We also had to rewrite a shader. Very clever stuff. But it was simultaneously released on Windows and Mac via Steam, Xbox One, PlayStation 4, Switch, iOS and tvOS with Android a day or two later. So I think we did okay. So trailers and marketing. While the game got out on time, a lot of it came, quite, came together quite late, which limited the marketing campaign and how much interest we were able to drum up for it. In addition, as a small game, we were quite limited with what we were able to show. We also didn't want to share anything disrespectful to the IP, so even though we had a lot of bugs and things that seemed pretty funny to us, it wasn't something that seemed in line with the brand and to the vision. So we focused on the vision for the trailers. When it came to working on the trailers, I actually referenced an idea that I'd read that was, I think, in relation to the first page of a novel, which is, this is where you make a promise to the audience about the type of experience that you're going to give them. It was important, very important, that we sell to people exactly what Stormboy was. I knew that if we didn't make the right promise to people, we'd likely get a lot of backlash. Our game pillars again came in handy to make sure that the trailers made a promise to the player that we would be keeping. I was especially worried that our interactive retelling wouldn't be understood or taken well by the general public. But by making sure that our messaging was consistently making the promise that would be fulfilled in the game, we hoped that between our trailers and marketing material, people would generally understand what the game was, even if it wasn't for them. Stormboy the game certainly wasn't perfect. We had to make a lot of decisions quickly which meant that most of the time we made the best decision that we could at the time 
and only optimised or changed when it really wasn't working well. We did playtest small parts, but maybe we had too many tiny abstract sections to really make it feel meaningful. But most people seem to understand what the game was and who it was for. And I've heard of people finding the build on a switch on a convention floor and somehow to manage like they've been testing one of our other games for a while and then they play the, through the whole thing and they're crying at the end. I watch people playing for the first time and have a mix of confusion and then delight as they return to a childhood sense of playfulness. I've watched little kids squeal in delight as Mr Percival plays fetch with them. We've now updated the game to be localised into French, German, Spanish and Russian. Schools contacted us asking for keys for their school library. And we trust that as the book is read every year, maybe we'll also get new players every year. And if we've been able to hone the experience enough that those players have been quietly touched or remember playing games the way that I played with games incorrectly as a child or think back to their first pet or the first person that they lost, then I think Storm Boy, the Storm Boy team has achieved what we wanted to achieve. Thank you. Now, it is question time. I have been told that the microphone is out of battery. So please use your, your outside voice, your theatre voice, to project any questions you may have. If you're quiet, I'll try and repeat and, um, and answer the best I can. I think I just, okay, in case, in case that didn't get recorded. With the tight development schedule, how did I figure out how many blocks of content I would have? I think part of it was me having a feeling for how long a game would take to make. So that's just my own experience. I also went and nutted down what the biggest, like what would be the minimal, minimum viable product to tell the story would be. Um, and then we thought about how long it would take to prototype each of those from a gameplay perspective to see if it worked. And, um, and then mostly just panicked <laughs> and just did our darndest and, and, and looked at how long we had for each of those. And then I, again, deferred to the teams to tell me what was too much or impossible. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm looking to Jess now. Did we have to crunch? I don't think so. We weren't doing, no, we weren't doing nights or anything. <laughs> she says, well. I think it was mixed. Some people were excited that we'd have something that would be out so quickly. Um, so they liked that it was something that was going to be small and contained and kind of had to be, um, yeah, had to be defined early. So they liked having that focus. Um, I, I think other people slightly panicked. I think that would have summed up the, like most people's feelings about it overall, one of those two camps. Yeah. Um, do you have any key contacts with the IP holder of like running stuff by them through the process, or were they basically just like, this is this is fine, go? Yeah. So our uh, we did keep contact with the IP holder. Um, we had weekly meetings, and gosh darn it, Victor from New Holland is such a sweetheart, and we looked forward to the call with him every week, even if it was like a ten minute check in of um, anything that we want to ask or anything that you know. We need to run by him. Um, so we were sending him emails as well of just passing anything on. And also, yeah, as I said, that, that 
10 minute minimum weekly call. Yeah. Yes, so um, the development team is all in Sydney. Uh, our team fluctuated. We went from a core of about six people was I think the core and then we ended up using most of the studio at some point or another and I think at that time we were probably mid-20 people maybe. I feel like Jess should answer this one. I know what I'd say. I'd say that um, probably the, the underwater swimming scenes required a lot of trickery and also a lot of totally unique elements that couldn't be used anywhere else in the game, so they were quite expensive. Um, on the other hand, they also were the most, one of the most technically draining scenes, performance-wise. Um, aside from that challenge, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. For the record, Jess says a lot of it was just the technical compromises that we had to make or, you know, where the vision would have to change and we had to make choices along the way um, in order to try and maintain that vision with that short time frame. Yeah. We, in terms of play testing and focus testing, we kind of did essentially like informal friends and family observational things. So we'd put it in front of someone that wasn't necessarily a gamer and um, whether they were someone's mum or someone's daughter or son and we just tried to like take on board if like they just had no idea what was going on or if, you know, watch them and try and take notes and then integrate that as much as possible. Um, normally I would say, you know, don't, don't make changes because one person struggles with something. But we had such a short period of time that rather than waiting for three people to confirm it, we just kind of took it on board and said, should we change this? Probably. Like, let's make it easier. Let's make it more understandable. Um, so the first big test we got was PAX West. Yeah. Uh, another question, maybe you don't mind. Not at all. So with the original, uh, with the 1970s film, mm. uh, my mother can't watch it, she's bursting into tears. <laughs> so I'm wondering um, which uh, showcase in the game, if you've gotten any of those types of reactions, people getting really moody or starting to tear up, like those real human emotions. Yeah, absolutely. So um, not only the, the story of someone just playing it on a, like, I think it was, PAX West this year, they found the game and they started playing. We weren't showing it, it just happened to be on the Switch. And, um, and yeah, apparently like they were just sitting there and like wiping away tears. Um, this, the streamer that I showed in the Hunters scene, she's like, she's crying. Her name's seriously Clara. Poor Clara. She's like crying, like absolutely bawling. Um, I've seen other streamers do that. I've seen Achievement Hunter Guide streamers get to that point and be like, ah. Oh, all right, this part. <sighs> I hate this part. And then it gets to the end and the, you know, the gun shot it. Oh, why would you do that? And it's like, oh, I hate this. Anyway, on to the next achievement. And it's like, <laughs> okay. So, yeah. <laughs> Oh. 
Now, this is assuming that I know from the start that I've got more time. Or is this like, you have more time to work on it right now? Yeah, sequel, well, boy, do we have joke sequels. <laughs> Storm Boy 2, this time it's Percival. Um, <laughs> if only. Um, I think the one thing we'd do, honestly, is a fishing minigame. That was one thing that we thought we'd like to do, um, and that when you're sailing around, that you could either dive into the ocean or you could sit down and, and fish. Because, you know, is your game good? Does it have a fishing game? Yes, no. So I'd like to make the game good by including a fishing minigame. Um, but yeah, if, if I had more time at the start, I think we'd... Um, investigate things more thoroughly earlier on. Because, yeah, as Jess said, a lot of the, the, the biggest sort of regrets were things that we had to compromise or kind of patch together or, you know, we just had to keep moving forward. So if we had more time early on, I think we could have investigated things a, a lot more thoroughly and made better decisions, but we did the best that we could. Cool. I got through all of the questions. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Thank you all for coming. <laughs>